Dreaming is an act of pure imagination. It's a creative power that enables the wildest thoughts and ideas to potentially come to life. When you have a dream that you can't let go of, trust your instincts and pursue it. But it won't become a reality through magic. Real dreams take work and determination. They take patience and sometimes they require you to dig down very deep. If you're willing to have the courage to do that, then your dreams can and will come true. Valle Guadalupe was originally developed by the Russian colonies. They had a very close society. So they had very little communication through the, the other people around. And then in the 50s, when the road was opened and paved, it was the first wave, in my opinion. The valley was opened the eyes to others. Most of the Russians lived and emigrated to, to California to the United States. Other people come, but uh, it was still rural. It was nothing. On the 70s, uh, it started the development. We had the Fiesta de las Vendimias. It was a very tight community, all Ensenada. Nobody from elsewhere was coming. Maybe one or two gringos that were crazy enough to cross the border, but it was very, very much local. No, there were people that really believed in what we were doing and in and, and the, and, and the region, Hans Bakov, like the pioneers here. I think like the modern analogy begun with that generation. 1985, there were only 10 wineries in Mexico. That's it. We're talking about 34 years ago, 10 wineries in the whole country. We were experimenting a little bit like Napa at that time with Cabernets, with Merlots, with kind of varietals that sell a lot. But of course, tourism wasn't even in the picture. No, it was just winemaking, that's it. Whatever tourism happened was mostly in Ensenada, not really in, in the valley. And I think those pioneers kind of set the basis to get an identity because of course you have to experiment and, and you know Camilo Magoni came here, he was one of the first ones and of course he brought Italian varietals, no? He's Italian. I emigrated to Mexico contracted by the Cheto family. I was there for, to, with them since 65 to 2014, 49 years. Why? Because every year we had something new to do. I think the routine killed people, so I, I need problem <laughs> to, to maintain my mind. So that was the, 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 the great opportunity for me as a winemaker. And everyone kind of with their past and history started planting what they liked and what they thought would adapt. But then it started growing and, and, and more varietals came in and people, I don't know how they ended up here because there were no hotels, there were no restaurants, there were no visits. As time went by, probably close to the late 1990s, the beginning of 2000, that's when you started seeing an increasing number of wineries in the country pop up. Talking to uh, other people in the, in the Valle, you've been mm -hmm. here for quite some time. Yes. Um, and you're not from here originally, so talk to me, what made you come to the Valle and actually stay. Well, I was born in the countryside in the north of England near Manchester, moved to Los Angeles and from Los Angeles discovered this valley. And a couple of weekends later, my wife and I found ourselves down here meeting a few of the people in the valley, a few of the winemakers. There were not many at all in those days. We fell in love with the valley. A couple of weeks later, we had come back to look for a property. I think it was 2002 when we, when we bought the property in this valley. I was in, in Bordeaux and I started hearing, oh, Valle Guadalupe, Valle Guadalupe. And, and I think a lot of it, you know, when, when you are from some place and, and you don't see what you have because you think that's normal. 
And a lot of people started coming into Ensenada, coming into the valley and saying, wow, this is amazing, this is special. You know, we have perfect uh, weather for, for vines and the wines are super interesting. And I think it's even though they were pioneers from Ensenada, what really made us realize that this was special was people coming from abroad, no? from or just even uh, Mexico City or anywhere else, just because we didn't realize the potential that we had. When you started, you were one of the first. You kind of pioneered the yes, whole environment. Absolutely. But, but talk to me, because there's a bit of risk there. We wanted to start um, a winery in probably in, in, in Napa or something like that. All of a sudden, we hear about a Valle de Guadalupe in Mexico where people grow grapes. And I, I thought we have to go there. So immediately the next Saturday when we had off, we came. And it was strange because I didn't really know where it was. We stayed in Ensenada. And the person who is still the mayor now of Ensenada has a hotel where we stayed. And we were asking, where's the Valle de Guadalupe? Do we fly for a place? And he said, no. You just go there tomorrow and it's over these mountains and, and then you'll find it. And then he said, better yet. He said, how about I give you my car and my chauffeur tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, he'll be here and he'll take you there. And so I saw him maybe a month ago in one of these events, he's the he's mayor. Yeah. And I said to him, you know, to how many people have you said that in your life? He said, only once. So 2002, you, you talk about a handful of, of wineries at yeah. that time. When did it spark interest to actually start a winery? Most of the people that I was now spending time with worked with or for wine. You know, they're people who are winemakers, grape growers. I realized that Hugo da Costa, the most well-known winemaker in Mexico, even now, certainly at that time, that he offered classes to people who wanted to learn about winemaking. And Ugo taught quite a number of us how to make wine. The valley started growing by experimenting with new varietals, by welcoming people from other countries. And with food, it became a destination. Even though we started off with, with agriculture, it really became a destination. Today, I think we're in a fine line, no, where it's really important to keep our land and our agriculture you know, alive. That's why this exists. But of course, what good is that if you don't communicate and if you don't welcome people? You have to open up to the world. So tourism is a big and important part of what we're doing too. But that fine line, it's kind of our job to kind of you know, maintain it and be sure that we don't lose the sense of what, what we're having. And so, Thanks to people that came from Ensenada and elsewhere, you know, Camilo Magoni, Hugo da Costa, uh, Hans Bakov, the pioneers kind of saw that potential of, of food, wine, and scenery or, or paysage, and they worked their ass off and, and promoted the region and, and, and experimented. Middle of uh, was 2005, 2007, uh, was starting the gastronomy development the Eno gastronomy and that is keep the valley on top of it. I've been all over the place. I was 10 years in, in Europe. I was in uh, Hawaii, uh, worked in China for a while. From there I went to LA and worked as a private chef for a while. I didn't even know about the valley at that point. Didn't know that Mexico made wine at that point. Yeah. Was invited up to the valley for like a fam trip, it was wine buyers, and because I was in a position where I was chef and wine buyer, and I'd started to get interested in Mexican wines. Yeah. Because I get there and it's like, what do you mean Mexico makes wines? Yeah, exactly. Right, I had no idea. And I want to try more, I want to try more, and come in and taste and taste this and do this. And... Kind of things kept growing, and food has been a big part of history here. You know, Baja is very different. We're very isolated from the capital very, very far away, and most of the founding families here are French, Italian, there's a lot of Basque uh, family, my family is, is from the Basque country, so we have a blend 
of a lot of cultures. All of that kind of diversity made Baja different. We are 100% Mexican and proud of being it, but it made it made the region very, very different. I think people from Mexico or from, from the States, when they came, they had a different image of what Mexico was supposed to be and they discovered Baja to be something extremely different. Everywhere I'd worked in Europe, uh, France, Germany, and Switzerland, the places where I was were very, very close to the wine producing regions. I was in Lyon with Paul Bocuse. I was in uh, uh, Vence with Jacques Maximin, so called the Provence and all of that. And I'd never made wine, but I was always interested in it. I always found that where wine is produced, there's a higher culinary IQ. People tend to be slower in their lifestyle. In the end, you're really dependent on the vineyard. You're a farmer. You only make wine once a year. Right. But, you know, it's 11 months. The rest of the time, you're preparing your plants to produce the fruit that you need to make your wine. So it's a pastoral life, there's always big tables and people eating and the community and the social and the talking and the communication and liquid conversation. Oh yeah. And so I visited the valley for the first time and, and, and literally coming over the hill into the valley, it was the weirdest thing I had ever felt. It was like, I've been here before. I felt calm, I felt in my place and I'd never been to this place, didn't even know about it yeah. until that trip. And I came back and visited again and I was just like, every time I was here I just felt more like I wanted to be here more. I was in, in Bordeaux and then, you know, Robert Parker comes in and he's like, oh, well, you have an accent where you're from. Oh, I'm from, from Baja or Mexico. Oh, I know the Valle Guadalupe. I'm like, wow, Robert Parker knows Valle Guadalupe? Like, what did I miss? And yeah. it's exciting what you're doing. And it, it became a destination because of, you know, a group of Ensenadenses and people from, from outside believed and saw, you know, this is not normal. It's not normal to eat this freshness of sea urchin in a carreta in yeah. the middle of the street with cars going through. This is a Michelin star plate, no? And you're paying 50 pesos for this, what you would pay 50 euros in a restaurant. And they saw that even though for us it was normal, it was exceptional. I really, really do think that the evolution of the valley is very um, linked to food. Food and, and, and the quality of life, no? For one moment, I think winemaking pushed uh, chefs and now I think chefs are pushing us. I had the opportunity to do this as a summer pop-up. There was nothing here, it was just pine trees. Yeah. I was like, sure, yeah, okay, we'll do it. And I just totally fell in love. Two, two and a half months here, and it was like, yeah, I wanna be here. I wanna be here, I wanna be here, I wanna be here, I wanna be here. One day, Ugo is a big reason why I came to the valley for the first time, and Ugo da Costa, and, and he said, we really appreciate the work you're doing in Cabo to help the valley with your wine list but if you really want to help the valley, you should be here full time. Okay, Patron. Got it. Went back, closed my restaurant in Cabo, and came back and went full time here. So we're on, we, the restaurant's been open seven years, and we've been five, five years now, like 365, all year round. There is no better time to live in this valley and to enjoy whatever is happening, not only with the wine, but the gastronomy in general, what is going on right now, all this friendship between uh, cookers yeah. and winemakers is amazing. Because people come here and say, hey, your competition, this is my compadre, yeah. this is my friend, this is my, my partner in, in another business. We're not competing with each other. We are trying to do our best uh, and this, that's it. I mean, it's, uh, and enjoying life. In Valle, at this moment, everybody's willing to help you. Yeah, that's absolutely it's, it's, it's amazing that people, when they're sitting here, they don't understand why we can be just a 20 seat table, 15 producers, wife or whatever. I mean, uh, this is the, the, the way we are here. We know that it's a, it's a developing area, so we need to help each other. 
you're 20 plus years in Napa, you know, so talk to me a little bit about your, your experience and what brought you to the Valle. A lot of people that are here, you know, think that they are already riding the wave, but me coming from the outside, I actually see it as the wave is barely starting to really take off. And, and really in Napa, you know, we're at, at that top of the wave right now, um, where, you know, for, for somebody new to the industry like myself, while I've already been there for a long time, it's very difficult to even come across a plot of land because you're talking about a half million dollars for you know a half acre of property out there. Down here, it's still a little bit more feasible to say I can think about owning a strip of land at some point where I can you know start a Chateauneuf uh, style vineyard and winery you know in the future. I don't think. A lot of people have a very, in Mexico at least, a very clear idea in regards to starting a winery. It's basically something that you get sucked into. Since uh, we're not like the old country in regards having families that have done this for generations, I would say that it's mostly the Mexican side or the entrepreneurial side of the Mexicans that sucks you into this, right? because we see the glam around it, we see the family around it, the union, our colleagues and everything, and, and that makes you want to be part of it, I guess. Back then, did you ever think it was going to get to a point of it? All the information that everybody had in those days indicated that nothing would ever happen here. Hugo da Costa was promoting the making of good wine so that this would become a wine region but no one could possibly expect that we would have even a quarter of the hotels, wineries, restaurants that we now have. Yeah. Now many other people have come, either with Hugo's help or independently, and instead of having uh, perhaps 20 winemakers, now we have 200. Uh, I believe that it's a time in Valle de Guadalupe to really prevent the industry from taking over to make it a, a monoculture that, that it's only wine and, and tourism that drives this, this town. And I think that we, we can definitely prevent the same mistakes from happening that have occurred in Napa. Over the last three years, the amount of tourism that we've gotten from the United States, I'm talking about the US right now, mostly Southern California, has increased 500, 600%. We're getting more and more inquiries from the United States, from tour operators, importers, distributors, restaurants, uh, just general tourism. During the summer months, we usually get a pretty even number of Mexican to American customers here. But during the winter months, we get about 85% of our customers come from California. Wow. Yeah, that's wow. pretty insane. The possibilities here, I believe, are, are really what attracted me that, you know, we were talking about even what, what varietals work the best down here. And it's still kind of the wild west of, you know, wine growing because we still don't really know what works the best. There are some varietals that do better than others, but I'd say it's still kind of the Game of Thrones happening down here, you know. It's been the last maybe four or five years where I think we've really stepped up in quality to a level where we're internationally competitive. As of right now, we can bring out a lineup of 30, 40 of the best Mexican wines and we can set it up right next to any other country in the world and we can be super competitive against them. Yeah. Yeah.